before I begin, just the, the kind of overarching goal here is to understand smooth four manifolds. So this is a pretty <coughs> difficult problem. Um, and somehow for closed smooth four manifolds, kind of the only tool we have is a cyborg Witten invariant. And it's not really very good at uh, understanding manifolds without very much, say, second homology. Uh, so you, I'd really like to understand smaller smooth four manifolds. And an approach to this, which is somewhat effective, um, and you know, has potential to, to be extremely effective, um, uh, is by using concordance. groups and say cabordism groups. Cabordism groups of three manifolds and concordance groups of knots. Um, so cabordism groups of three manifolds, if you thought about them just a little bit, are all trivial, or that you think they're trivial. But in fact, if you place restrictions on the type of homology for the, for the, uh, for the equivalence relation, the, the four manifolds that play the role of the equivalence relation, um, then it gets very interesting and very, uh, very much unknown, uh, the general structure. OK, and so the focus of the talk is going to be on topologically sliced knots. So my plan is to give you a little bit of background for those of you who don't know anything about concordance um, on you know, the definitions and what's known, a little bit of history about topologically sliced knots, uh, and then focus on, on a recent theorem um, pertaining to them. OK, so oh, should I stop at 12? I mean, it's 11.30 now, but OK. Well, but lunch is at 12, right? <laughs> okay, so I mean, somehow, you know, with the temptation up there, yeah. well, I'll try to, I'll try to, I'll, I'll listen to Josh's stomach. Okay, so uh, definition. So I'll call two knots, um, k knot and k one. So these are embeddings of a circle in the three sphere concordant. And I'll write k not as equivalent to k1 if there exists a smooth. So, so I have a smooth embedding of an annulus or a cylinder into the three sphere cross the interval uh, such that the restriction of this embedding to its ends are equal to the knots in question. So if you never thought about this before, um, it's important to note, uh, well, it's sort of obviously equivalence relation because I can stack these uh, concordances, the, these cylinders embedded in the three sphere across the interval on top of each other. But it's also important to note that I'm not requiring the embedding to be level preserving. That would be the relation of isotopy, which is the sort of three-dimensional equivalence relation for knots. Uh, so it's a, this is a weaker equivalence relation than isotopy. But another thing I could do is I could just, you know, I don't have to use cylinders. I could use arbitrary uh, surfaces interpolating between two knots. So these would be cabordisms. Uh, and it's also, you, this is not such a good idea. If you allow arbitrary cabordisms between knots, then any two knots are cabordant because it's pretty easy to see that any knot in fact, bounds a smoothly embedded surface in the three sphere itself, which would give rise to a cabordism to the unknot. Okay, so right. So much of my interest lies in this following proposition, which I guess goes back to Fox in the '60s, is that you can consider a set of knots modulo this relation. Uh, and this, this set is an abelian, has an abelian group structure called the concordance group. So the addition operation is 
obtained by the connected sum operation, not theory. So this is what I do is I take some ball with a, a trivial arc in it. Uh, I remove such a trivial arc from each knot. And then I glue the uh, boundary two spheres together along the endpoints. So I can define it uh, extrinsically as well, diagrammatically. But this is a nice way to do it. Uh, the identity element in the group is the concordance class of the knot with no crossings, the unknot. Uh, it's pretty clear that this doesn't change the uh, you know, connect sum with. The unknot doesn't change the knot type, and hence the doesn't change the concordance class. And then, so if I want to consider the inverse operation, this is gotten by considering the concordance class of a particular knot derived from K, which is the reversed, or which is the mirror image of K. Uh, with its orientation as a, as a one manifold reversed. So, so if I have an oriented knot, say with the diagram like this, I can change all of the crossings from over to under, and then simultaneously change the orientation of the knot. This is what I mean by reverse mirror image. Okay. So the only non-trivial part of this proposition is uh, part three. So. Part three, the trick is so consider a, a three ball um, with a trivial arc cross that with the interval that sits naturally inside of the three sphere. OK across the interval. And so if you remove this ball arc pair from uh, the, the, you know, this trivial cylinder, which arises from k cross i inside the three sphere cross i, uh, then what you get is you a smoothly embedded disk bounded by k connect sum the mirror image reversed of k inside the four ball. And so if you have a smoothly embedded disk bounded by a knot, you can use that to produce a concordance to the unknot, just as you can use a smoothly embedded disk in the three sphere to produce an isotopy to the unknot. Okay. And also just a remark is that this also shows that there are many knots, um, for instance, many non-trivial knots. For instance, take your favorite non-trivial knot k, connect some of it with its reverse mirror image. That, that bound a smoothly embedded disk and hence are, uh, represent the trivial class. The trivial class in concordance is so important that it's frequently referred to by a special name. So, and not a slice if it represents zero in concordance. So this is equivalently, as I mentioned, If there exists a smooth embedding of a disk, four ball, it's restricting the boundary. This guy. Sure. Uh, well, yeah. So I know that that's the first paper, but I think that maybe Fox was touting it before that. I mean, uh, I'm... Was his advisor. I yeah, 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 was, yeah. Uh, about yeah, no, I know the paper, yeah. And, uh, I mean, the paper appeared in the annals and... I, no, no, in annals... Oh, this is the, this is... It is Proceeding of National Academy of Science. Okay, okay. American... Uh, and this was 56 it appeared? Science. Yeah. It's, uh, oh, oh, okay. So I, yeah. So I'm two lines. Okay. Then they uh, okay. had uh, half time to prove uh, some uh, result about this, and it was postponed. I think until '61. I see. Two, I see. I see. Not in annals, but uh, if I remember correctly, in some Japanese journal. Yeah, you're right. You're right. In Austria. Yeah. Yes. 
And uh, the, the last uh, remark uh, concerning this, um, then it was called co not concordance, but Kabbalism yeah. for quite a while. Uh -huh. Buddhism was not considered because of the realist. Then it was uh, changed because Kabbalism became Okay. Right, so, um, good. So much of my interest uh, in this group lies in the fact that I can define it in both the smooth category, which I've been doing here. I mean, all of my embeddings are, uh, are C infinity. But I can also uh, define a group in the topological setting. So, so I... So the first thing I'd like you know, that you, you'd think to do is just say, well, let's con consider continuous embeddings of, of a cylinder in a three-sphere cross I. And this is not such an interesting thing to do, because if you think about it, if I consider the cone on the pair, the three-sphere K, then this is homeomorphic to uh, the pair D4 Two disk, so this is so this is supposed to say then that every knot, if you define it in this naive way, would be concordant to the unknot in the topological uh, setting. So the trick um, turns out to give something very interesting is to well, is to just assume that you have a topological analog of the normal bundle that you would get um, from the tubular neighborhood theorem in the smooth setting. So you require that you have a natural embedding of the cylinder into the cylinder across uh, the disk, and then require that you have a factorization of the map like this. And you get a corresponding equivalence relation, which I'll call topological concordance. I'll denote it sim sub top. And I get a corresponding group, math cal c upper top, or superscript top. Uh, these are the topological concordance group and the topological concordance, and we have obviously corresponding notion of topological slice knots, those knots which bound topological disks in, in this sense. Yes. <laughs> but I'll use my own macros. <laughs> so, okay. So, we have a natural forgetful homomorphism between the smooth group to the topological group. And the kernel of this homomorphism I'll denote C sub TS. This stands for topologically sliced. This is the subgroup of the smooth concordance group generated by those knot that's knots that bound topological, topologically embedded disks in that sense. So I'll call this the topologically sliced subgroup. And it's this subgroup um, that I'm primarily interested in today. One of the reasons for my interest is that, well, hopefully it's clear that it contains information about the distinction between uh, smooth and topological concordance, if any. Um, but there's a very nice theorem. I, this is, I believe, due to Gomp, although um, I think it appears in a book with Gomp and Stipschitz. Um, says that, so suppose this group, the topologically sliced subgroup, is non-trivial, then this implies there exists, so a smooth four-manifold, which is homeomorphic to R4, but not diffeomorphic. So this is an exotic smooth structure in R4. This is the unique dimension in which uh, such phenomenon occurs. Um, uh, and so it's telling us that the topological size subgroup certainly contains some information about uh, smooth four-dimensional topology. It's a distinction between uh, that and topological topology. OK. so. Any questions? All right, so 
So I want to give a little bit of history about what's known about the, the topological display subgroup up to now. And so in the early 80s, uh, we had two revolutions in, in, in this context, one from uh, Friedman in the topological context and one from Donaldson in the smooth context. And so, and, so I'll get the history wrong for this, for sure. In fact, somehow, each time I sort of mention any of this, I, I change the date slightly. And, and then if Rob Kirby is in the audience, he tells me that the dates are wrong. And then I change it to, well, as far as I know, I'm changing it to what he says. But then it's wrong again. So I, I mean, I was, so I, I mean, I should maybe. So I'll put, I'll put my birth here just to let you know. I mean, I'll spell my name correctly. Uh, anyway, so I don't really know what happened at this time. Um, so, but but what I do know is that, or what 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 I believe to know, I mean, is that is that Kasson um, uh, observed the Donaldson's theorem on the diagonalizability of uh, intersection negative definite intersection forms of uh, closed simply connected four manifolds. Um, that time uh, implies. Uh, There exist k knots such that their Alexander polynomial is equal to 1, but their concordance class is not 0. Around the same time, Friedman's result in surgery uh, could be used to show that if you have a knot whose Alexander polynomial is 1, then k is topologically slice. So this gives non-triviality of, of the topologically slice subgroup. And so at that point, uh, in, the, in subsequent years, uh, a, a collection of people, uh, including Akpalut, um, uh, Gomf, Cochran, uh, Rudolf, Matveyev, uh, and many others you know, devoted some amount of effort into producing more and more non-trivial classes in this subgroup. And I highlight some of this work occurred in 95, result of Indo, which really drew heavily on, on, on some foundational work of uh, Fintischel, Stern, and Feruda in the context of uh, SO3 gauge theory, um, and he showed that this subgroup, uh, topologically slice subgroup, is quite large, and it's large enough to contain an embedded uh, uh, z of infinity. Okay. So um, we had uh, some some striking advances in the early aughts. Um, uh, coming from Hagard fleur homology of, of, of Oshwat and Sabo, and uh, also some interesting invariants coming from Kabanov homology um, in the form of the S invariant that Jake Rasmussen defined. And in 2005 ish, um, combined papers of Manolescu, Owens, and Livingston showed that. This topologically sliced subgroup uh, splits off a z cube sum and. So uh, the, the group is isomorphic to sum, and being group G uh, direct sum z cubed. And so you know, it, it seems very likely that the subgroup, the topologically sliced subgroup, contains a z to infinity. And there are invariants to do that. And so there's a calculational problem here. And so you know, I think it's sort of worth the while to try to bump this number up gradually. Um, so an open problem would be so. Okay, so, um, so I want to digress just a moment to uh, discuss a, a, a very well-known construction in the theory of knots called the satellite construction. Do you have candidates for the infinite? What's that? Do you have candidates for detecting the infinite? Oh yeah, I have all sorts of candidates, but uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Do you, I mean, I'll show them to you at some point if you want. So it's a computation of the 
D invariance of branch cyclic covers that is the obstruction to, to getting this going. So I think that almost certainly those invariants contain enough uh, information to see a Z to infinity, but the computing is relatively difficult. Yeah, I mean, you could, in principle, take P to the k-fold cyclic covers for a fixed prime P, and that provides an infinite family of homomorphisms, um, which presumably distinguish, uh, which presumably would, would prove this result. But as you probably know, I mean, it's sort of difficult to compute the invariance uh, arbitrarily well. Um, so, yeah, it's getting better, though. It's, that's somehow the part of the philosophy, or the not the philosophy, the, the theme of this talk. So if I have a knot embedded in a solid torus, um, then I can consider a homeomorphism of that solid torus, which identifies the solid torus with a neighborhood of your favorite knot k in the three-sphere. Okay. And under that homeomorphism, I can consider the image of P. So this is some knot now in the three-sphere. I'll call that a satellite of the knot K with pattern knot P. And it's not so hard to see that such an operation defines a, a, a well-defined map from the set of isotopy classes of knots to the set of isotopy class of knots. If you had an isotopy of k to some other version of itself, then you would just let the solid torus neighborhood follow along that isotopy, and at the same time, allow the knot embedded in the solid torus p to follow that isotopy. Um, but moreover, we get, by passing to concordance, we get a well-defined operator on the concordance group. Um, and satellite operators and concordance have played a very essential role in, in much of its study over the over the past, well, 20, 20 or more years. Um, it's important to note that, in general, uh, the satellite operators are not homomorphisms. In fact, another question, uh, which is open, is, is there any P such that P is a non-trivial meaning non-zero homomorphism. On concordance. So I think that's also a very interesting question. So in this, in this realm, um, there's a very interesting satellite operation which will come up throughout the talk. Maybe I should. draw it in red. So I have this particular knot in the solid torus. I'll call that knot D. So I get an operator D from concordance to itself called whitehead doubling. So P's a knot in the salad torus. Well, yeah, I mean, so probably you want it to not be contained in a three ball, or else that's uh, pretty trivial. And, and, and you're, are you, you're insisting that H is, you know, takes a long longitude. Yeah, I mean, there's a, yeah, I mean, this identification depends on, yeah, I mean, there's some framing involved in identifying the salad torus with a neighborhood of K. Yeah, we, and we, we need to do the same for all knots, right? Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm always picking the D longitude that comes from a cipher surface. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Does there exist a knot in a solid torus such that the corresponding satellite operation obtained from that knot in the solid torus induces a non trivial homomorphism on concordance? So you can actually, I mean, you can imagine taking your favorite ribbon knot and placing it in the solid torus in such a way that it's ribbon within the solid torus. You do, you know, I could take 
the band sum, some interesting band sum of two unknots. So here's a band sum of two unknots. This induces an operator on concordance, but it's clearly trivial because I could yeah. concord it to the unknot inside the salad torus. Yeah. So that's what I mean. So you can produce the trivial. You know, you might think at first, well, what about connected sum with a fixed k? That's not really a homomorphism. That's like a module structure or something. So it doesn't. That's not a homomorphism either. Okay. So this is called whitehead doubling. Um, one of the reasons it's gained sort of notoriety in this context is that you can compute uh, the Alexander polynomial using a well-known uh, sort of Meyer via torus formula for um, well, for twisted homology. You can compute the Alexander polynomial, the whitehead double, and it's always equal to one for any knot. So I take any knot k, I get an Alexander polynomial one. Um, this is d, this is delta. Um, you get an Alexander polynomial one knot. So what this is telling us is that doubling on a topological concordance group is the zero map. So it takes k to zero. Okay. Um, and there's a, a, a conjecture of Kirby on his problem list which says that can be phrased that the inverse image of the zero class is zero for smooth. So this is somehow saying that, I mean, again, white head doubling is not a is not a homomorphism, so this isn't saying that, yeah, I don't know. But it's still some kind of injectivity. <coughs> so I can't resist to just mention this next result, which I proved with Paul Kirk of several years ago now, maybe 09-ish. Um, that uh, the image of whitehead doubling itself contains a z to infinity uh, subgroup uh, contained then, of course, inside the topologically sliced subgroup. And so if you like, this z to infinity can be spanned by the image of torus knots. And so we conjectured that whitehead doubling uh, takes independent sets in smooth concordance to independent sets. And it, I, I mean, somehow whitehead doubling is going to expand concordance. So what I mean by that is if, you know, even if I looked at the whitehead doubles of connected sums of the trefoil, the 2, 3 torus knot, I expect that this subgroup generated by whitehead doubles of connected sums of 2 and torus knot should have infinite rank. So that's, that's you know, far from what you'd expect from homomorphism because subgroup generated by one knot inside concordance at the rank at most one. OK, and this, to me, this, so, oh, why can't I resist talking about this? Well, because the, the key feature that distinguishes, uh, that sort of filters the z to infinity is the, the Chern-Simons invariance of SO3 connections, flat SO3 connections on uh, branched double covers of, of the knot. OK, so somehow it's the Chern-Simons invariant that sort of, I don't know, separates these, uh, the image of torus knots under whitehead doubling out. So, so uh, this result, as with many up until that point, was uh, we're always using Friedman's theorem that if you have an Alexander polynomial one knot, that's that the knot is topologically sliced. And so there was some, you know, reasonable question to ask that whether Friedman's theorem accounts for the topologically sliced subgroup in its entirety. So. To make, to make this precise, you can consider the set of all concordance classes of knots such that the, what, that the Alexander polynomial of the knot is equal to 1. It's important to consider smooth concordance classes of such knots because it's easy to produce um, topologically sliced knots that, are, that don't have Alexander polynomial 1. I, mean, I could just take some smoothly sliced knot with non-trivial Alexander polynomial and connect sum it um, with a topologically sliced knot that comes from the Alexander polynomial 1 construction. So you want to consider smooth concordance classes of knots that have Alexander polynomial 1. Now you consider the subgroup generated by concordance. I'll denote this by C delta uh, to indicate the Alexander polynomial. And this is clearly 
contained by Friedman's theorem in the topologically sized subgroup. So the question is whether or not uh, these two groups are equal. So again, a few years ago with uh, Livingston and Ruberman, we showed that, uh, well, there's a big distinction. This, this is also infinitely generated. Okay. And the technique here was coming from Higgard Fuller homology in the form of the D invariance of branch cyclic covers, which I'll say a bit more about now, or very soon. So just to sum up some other recent progress uh, in 2011, 2012, Jin Ham and uh, Tim Cochran, Shelley Harvey, and Peter Horn, uh, produce, well, very different but uh, interesting filtrations on, well, on the whole concordance group, which restricted non-trivial filtration in the topologically sliced subgroup. And Jin's construction relies on considering um, a kind of algebraic group of not floor homology complexes associated to, um, to knots. Whereas Cochran, Harvey, and Horns is much in the spirit of the um, filtration defined by Cochran, Orrin, Teichner, which draws on um, information contained in the derived series of the fundamental group of the knot complement. Um, both are non-trivial, and I think both are very interesting. But these results and, and all the prior ones, they, well, if you don't, if you never heard anything about it, you might expect that, well, that every non-trivial element in the topological slice subgroup is infinite order, because their results, too, if, if you go and look at them, it's, you know, they're not seeing anything about torsion. So the theorem I'll spend the rest of the time talking about, this is joint with uh, Segu Kim. Obviously, I have to include his whole name, but uh, Chuck Livingston will only get his last name um, to distinguish Segu from his. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so. Does he get all his last names? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, no, this is. is that there is indeed quite a lot of torsion in the topologically sliced subgroup. So this is, this is what I'll talk about now. Is there any questions? What's that? Only two. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, so somehow, you know, you know if the right thing to say is, well, of course there's two torsion. There's two torsion <laughs> everywhere, right? I mean, you sort of expect two torsion to exist in the, in the, in the concordance group in any category. Because uh, as, I'll, as I'll show in a moment, if you have a knot which is isotopic to its reverse mirror image, then it produces an element that's order two. These are called amphichiral knots, or fully amphichiral knots. Um, and so we've long known that there's two torsion in the ordinary concordance group, and, and you know, smooth or topological. But um, so it's maybe not so surprising that there's some two torsion. But the, the real issue is that you, know, you need something that detects two torsion here. And that's hard. I mean, because you know, we have a lot of homomorphisms to the integers. That's never going to see, you know, or you know, it's never going to see two torsion. So, so the, somehow the point is detecting it. Okay. All right. So, the, so there are sort of three steps involved in this process, um, and in increasing difficulty. So the first is a construction, and this I can tell you everything about because it's it's pretty easy once you see it. So I have to produce knots whose uh, concordance classes are both topologically sliced and two torsion. Um, but then, you know, I, there's a very interesting two torsion element that I have in, in most groups. It's the zero element. So I have to show that these two torsion elements, which I can, you know, I can tell you they're two torsion, I can prove it for you. But now I have to show that it's not zero. So this will come from an obstruction. And again, as I mentioned, this will be the Hagar floor homology of branch cyclic covers. 
And then you know, once you have an obstruction, I mean, it's great, but you have to compute it. And even the obstruction, I mean, once you're familiar with the, the general Hagar floor setup, it's not so difficult to see that there's some obstruction. Um, but then com computing it is really, this is where all the meat is. And this is what I'll you know, shield you from as my audience today. Um, but I will say a bit about it for those of you who have some experience trying to perform such computations. OK, so, so part one. So let's, com let's construct some, uh, some two torsion topologically sliced knots. So I want, I want a knot that satisfies 2 times k equals 0. So this implies k equals negative k equals this. OK, so, so as I mentioned then, if I can produce a knot which is isotopic, not just concordant to its reverse mirror image, then I produce a two torsion element. And here's an example. This is everybody's either first or second favorite knot, um, depending on, uh, I guess, whether you're a hyperbolic geometer. Um, so this is the figure eight knot, I hope. Uh, looks like it is. So I've drawn it in, in this way that, well, one, one thing about this is it makes it manifestly clear that it is uh, order two, because I could just take this band that goes behind the, behind the other band, I could swap, I could move it through this little space here, bring it around. And then that's supposed to indicate that if I was to instead take the reverse mirror image, um, that I would um, that I would get this knot, uh, that I would get the same thing. So this is smoothly isotopic to its reverse mirror image, and hence two torsion. However, the figure eight knot, by any number of means, um, for instance, classical uh, methods from algebraic topology, would tell you that this is not a smoothly sliced knot. It's not even topologically sliced. Right. Okay. So, yeah, okay, so this is not a topologically sliced knot, so we need to do something. So what I can do is I can take these bands here and I can tie some knots in them. So I'll just denote this by the, a box K. And then I tie a negative k here. Okay, so this means that you take these two bands and you just tie them up into your favorite knot k, and then it's reverse mirror image over here. So if I call this knot r, I'll call this knot r of k. Okay. So one thing to observe is that uh, that by the same trick which I alluded to passing this band up through this hole here, uh, you can show that RK is still an ampichiral knot, and hence two torsion. But we also have a proposition that if K is concordant to J, then RK is concordant to RJ. And here, this is smooth or topological. So if I have a topological concordance from K to J, I get a topological concordance from a rk to rj. And the proof of this is that if I consider this unknot here, its complement is a solid torus. And I think about this r as living in a solid torus and serving to define a satellite operation with pattern k. Then I do that once more as a result with, to obtain a satellite operation of, uh, with a different pattern, namely R tied with only one knot in its, one of its bands, and then uh, use that as a pattern with and the solid torus specified by the complement of that on knot. And so uh, RK is a twofold satellite operation. By the previous remarks, satellite operations do well defined maps on concordance, so if I Concordant knots, I'd get concordant satellites. Okay, and a corollary of this then is that if K 
is topologically sliced, then R of k connects some R a knot is topologically sliced. And of order two. Well, and the proof is that RK connects some RO is topologically concordant by the previous proposition to RO connects some RO. This was the figure eight knot, so but. This is actually smoothly concordant to the unknot. So this is now a topologically sliced knot. And RK connects some R with the unknot is actually isotopic to its reverse mirror image. OK, so this is, so hopefully this coiler is manifest. So we have now produced non-trivial, we've produced, so we have now produced uh, knots which are two torsion and are topologically sliced. So the game now is to try to show they're not smoothly sliced. Any questions about the construction? Okay. So moving on. So I want something that obstructs these. And before we talk about the, the actual invariant, I want to recall this proposition. And so it, it allows us to pass from a setting of knots to the setting of uh, homology cabordism of, of three manifolds. So we're going to use the well-known proposition that if k is slice, then This, so then a certain three manifold derived from K, which came up in Cameron's talk the other day, this is the two-fold branch cover. Of the three sphere branched over K. This three manifold bounds a particular nice four manifold, or a particularly simple four manifold, in the sense that the homology of this four manifold, Q, with Z2 coefficients, is the same as that of the four ball. And if you like its boundary, this, this three manifold has the same Z2 homology as that of the three sphere. So I'll call this a Z2 homology, Z2 four ball, or a Z2 homology three sphere in the, in the other case. OK, and the sketch of the proof here, you know, so this is maybe, this is like a Moderate. This is probably not a qualifying question in algebraic topology sequence, but it's uh, you know it's a reasonable question to think about um, given one's knowledge of, of Meyer via Torres um, and basic algebraic topology. So the idea is while well, we have the four ball, we have a disk inside the four ball uh, bounded by the knot k. I can take just the two-fold branch cover of the entire construction, and I get a four-manifold. And then you um, calculate its homology and show it satisfies these properties. No matter, it's the simplicity of the homology of the disk that gives rise to the simplicity of the homology of the four-manifold, if you like. OK, so now the, uh, maybe I just want to point out, because I think there's another very interesting uh, open question here, is that you know, the way to really think about this, what this is saying is that if I take a knot or its concordance class, then I can consider the Z2 homology cabordism class of its branch double cover. And this is a homomorphism. This is a, it's a homomorphism con concordance to Z2 homology cabordism group. So I take a knot, I form this three manifold, I consider that three manifold up to equivalence obtained by four-dimensional cabordisms between three manifolds with a Z2 homology of the three-sphere. 
Okay. What? Smooth or topological, if you like. And here I'm working smoothly because I'm trying to obstruct something smoothly. Yeah, definitely. But you know, so a question I have is you can do this. This, this proposition really extends for, for prime power cyclic branch covers, where I replace, instead of two, I replace this with ZP homology. So we get this homomorphism. Um, I don't know what to call it. Maybe I'll call it phi from the concordance group to the infinite product of ZP homology cobordism groups, where P is in primes, P ranges over primes, and I get uh, a bunch of them. I get one for each positive uh, integer. So I get this homomorphism for the concordance group to this huge product of homology cobordism groups. And the question is, is phi injective? I suspect the answer is no, but I don't have any examples. So it'd be, you know, this is kind of constructive uh, uh, topology. What I mean, is the role of What's that? What is the role? Uh, the role of the k is that I get a, uh, I can take the, so I can take the p to the k fold cyclic branch cover. Yeah. OK, so I think that's a very interesting question. I'd like to know the answer. Um, but moving on, um, I need to, so I, I now have this not, I want to show it's not smoothly sliced. And I have a, this three manifold that comes from it. And it bounds, a, if in the, in the presence of a slice disk, it bounds a very small four manifold. So I have to obstruct that four manifold from existing. And this is where Hegard floor homology enters the picture. So this was uh, introduced by Peter and Zoltan. Um, some years ago. And if I have a three manifold with, equipped with a spin C structure, which I'll click, quickly dispatch with, um, I get a I get a module called HF minus over polynomial ring in a single variable where F is the field of two elements. So this works in more generality. Um, and there's a structure theorem that they proved. And I'll abbreviate you guys by O and S to save time. I'm sorry, Peter, but I, yeah, anyway. So uh, the, the theorem is that if Y is a Z2 homology three sphere, as we're dealing with in the present context, and this holds more generally for rational homology spheres, then HF minus, well, its rank as an f of u module is 1. For any spin c structure. And of course, then I have some torsion. And this torsion is very interesting from the perspective of closed four manifolds, because this torsion submodule is where the four manifold invariant, the cyborg weight invariant, factors through. But from the perspective of, of kind of small four manifolds, it's this uh, it's the grading of the highest element in this f of u module, the, the free part, um, which, is, which is relevant. This is called the d invariant. Uh, it was studied by Froyshev in, in several other contexts. Um, and this is, a this is a rational number. So by this, I just mean that this, this bracket just means I've, I have this free f of u module, and the element 1 has grading this rational number. Okay. So this is a kind of structure theorem. OK, and so uh, another theorem is that these d invariants uh, provide obstructions to uh, a three manifold bounding certain four manifolds. So if y is the boundary of q, q4 equals a z2 homology four ball. And let me, let me, uh, let me make this a little bit more precise. So I have a four manifold. I can put a spin C structure on a four manifold. And I mean that this three manifold is the restriction. This spin C three manifold, Ys, is the restriction of a spin C four manifold. It's the boundary of a spin C four manifold, where this S is the restriction of the spin C structure to the boundary. OK, so under this hypothesis, then the D invariant for that particular spin C structure which comes from the four manifold, vanishes. Okay. 
So, I mean, there's kind of a logical thing that's going on here. I mean, you know, I'm trying to show Q doesn't exist. And so, since, it, since ultimately I want to show it doesn't exist, you know, the spin C structures that are on this non-existent format file also don't exist. So, you know, I'm having some kind of vanishing result for spin C structures in the boundary of a four manifold that doesn't exist. So I have to somehow get at the fact that, you know, I need to identify which spin C structures on the three manifold could arise as the restriction of spin C structures on a four manifold that don't exist. Okay, and this was something that, that I learned from, uh, from, from, from Cameron and, and Kasson um, in the context of, of Cass and Gordon invariants, which are very similar in spirit to the D invariants that we're discussing right now. So, <clears throat> So the observation, and one thing is if you've never seen spin C structures, now I can get rid of them for the moment, is that if y is a Z2 homology 3 sphere, then I have a map from spin C structures as a set to elements in H1 of y. And what I do is I take the spin C structure, I send it to, well, a spin C structure has a churn class, and then that lives in H upper 2 of the 3 manifold, and I use Poincare duality. I get some element in H1. And so this is a, this is a, a sort of a natural bijection um, uh, in the con when we have a Z2 homology 3 sphere. So, so we can just think, instead of thinking about spin C structure, I think about elements in H1 of the 3 manifold, and the set of spin C structures. So again, Y is the boundary of Q, this Z2 homology 4 ball. The set of spin C structures on Y, which extend, or could extend, over Q, are a subgroup inside H1. So now I'm using this identification now as spin C structure with the elements in H1 of Y. This subgroup satisfies two things. One, that its order squared is equal to the order of H1. And this is Z coefficients now. And the second, which is very important is that the, there's a bilinear Q mod Z valued form on the first homology of a three manifold called the linking form. And the linking form restricted to this subgroup, it vanishes. So this is a metabolic subgroup with respect to this uh, uh, linking form. And so this gives us a lot of, uh, a lot of leverage here because it's saying, well, if the First homology of the three manifolds in question, in this case, the branch double covers of these, of, of these knots, is simple enough, then, well, we can understand the linking form and we can identify all of its metabolic subgroups. And then subsequently calculate the D invariance. So I, I really don't want to go over because, well, it's lunchtime. Um, but so maybe I'll just conclude by um, computing, say, the D invariance, not computing, but uh, telling you the computations. Uh, the D invariance of the branched uh, double covers of uh, the figure eight versus the D invariance of R of K. And I'm, for those who know, I'm using an additivity result for the D invariance to say that under connected sum of three manifolds, which upon passing the branch double covers is mirroring the connected sum operation on knots, the D invariants are additive. So I have, so I have five elements in H1 of this three manifold. So I'm implicitly telling you that H1 of the branch double cover is Z mod five. In both cases, I can make a little table of the D invariance for those five uh, elements.
And so these are the d invariants for the branched double cover of the figure 8 knot. And what you can see is that the, so there's a metabolic subgroup inside. So if I take the connected sum of the figure 8 with itself, the h1 of the branch double cover is z5 plus z5. There's a subgroup. It's not the diagonal subgroup sitting inside of z5, z5. This is i, 2i. This is the metabolic subgroup. Um, and you can then use the additivity of the d invariance to show that, well, so I have i equals 1, negative 2 fifths, plus the d invariant associated to i equals 2. That's two fifths, so that equals zero. So we see, we see the vanishing of the d invariance for the branch double cover of the figure eight. Now what's very interesting is that when I tie the appropriate, an appropriate topologically sliced knot into, into R, in this case the whitehead double of, say, the trefoil knot, then the d invariants kind of magically jump around. Um, and they turn into these values. Now you can check that for this, again, unique metabolic subgroup of the branch double cover first homology. So this is RK connects some RO, that the, the D invariants don't satisfy this vanishing result. So you know, as I mentioned, I've completely uh, hidden from you the actual calculations here. One thing that was extremely useful in facilitating them was the fact that there, uh, some years ago I produced a, a closed formula for the not floor homology of the whitehead double of the knot. And now, and then there are pre existing formulas for how floor homology behaves under day in surgery. So it says, given some knot invariant, in this case, not floor homology, you can produce the floor homology of closed three manifolds obtained by surgery on that knot. Um, and so, you know, so somehow the, having the not floor homology of whitehead doubles in hand was a very useful tool. I should also say that this, I mean, I've computed the D invariants very points in my life is difficult. And this was the most difficult, um, because the branch double covers, as far as we they, they are not surgery on a knot, on a single component knot. They're really, the best we could do is they're, <laughs> they're surgery on a two-component link. And somehow these surgery formulas get very, very delicate as you iterate them. I mean, there's sort of, well, algebraic complications that, are, that arise upon trying to iterate surgery formulas from, not, from, from floor homology. It, that, was, that was really the, the, the main technical hurdle that we had to overcome. So I'll stop there. Well, it's, so it's the boils down to this, where I put uh, framings 2 and minus 2. And then there's another copy where this, it's coming from. This is the branch double cover of R of the unknot, some lint space, um, clearly. And, uh, and then you have the branch double cover of R of the whitehead double of the trefoil. So I guess in this case, K is the trefoil. Um, and you know, also another thing that was quite difficult here is I mean somehow, this is one example. We needed an infinite number of examples, and you know, doing something infinitely much is harder than doing it once, I mean, you know, typically. So that yeah, you know, so we you know, yeah, there's some kind of delicate argument about trying to vary the the framings of these bands while simultaneously varying the knots that you tie into K. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a, a fun game to play to sort of minimize how much computation you actually have to do. <laughs> um, so. Lunchtime.